There's different disconnects when people want to talk about an illness. People feel scared. They feel uncomfortable. So not a lot of family members know I'm HIV positive. My siblings do know. I'm sure that they've told my parents. I don't really talk to my parents, though, because it's also that preconceived notion that it's a gay virus. I don't really want them to know. I don't even want to talk to them in the first place if they're going to keep assuming these negative things about my sexual identity. When I first came out on social media, I need to like make this a, a second coming out, <laughs> you know? Like, I come out as gay in high school and I'm gonna come out now as HIV positive. And I had a lot of friends on my side supporting me during this moment. I spoke to Johnny and I told him one day, I was like, I'm HIV positive. And he said, oh, okay. Um, what are you wearing for tonight? <laughs> First of all, like, I was like, I didn't even know how to process it. You know, I was like, should I cry? Should I like say I'm sorry? Should I like ask him how, how, what? In that moment, it was very characteristic of like him. Always abrupt, always does something like, says it very bluntly, you know? So I was like, fine, maybe this is his way of like, <laughs> like just coming out, you know? Like, I'm like, all right, fine, fuck it. But I didn't want to make it a big deal. It's never been like a full like, Okay, so tell me, like, you know, no, it's never been like an, because it never, out of respect, I, I still feel like I never wanted it to be like an interrogation, you know, because I love him, you know, like I've always like, <laughs> I don't know. Aww. So like, I just want him to, to be well, you know. I've never seen him cry until today. <laughs> That's a lie. <laughs> I'm not saying I have 100% control of it, but I definitely have more harness now to just start talking about HIV. I feel that like everyone that you meet, like you inevitably learn something from them, you know? And I've learned a lot from Giuliani, like whether I want to acknowledge it or not. I'm glad, I'm glad that there's not this fear, you know? And I'm glad that he also started taking PrEP because I told him to. He's taking care of himself, and that, that reassures me because I also want to make sure that my friends are taking care of themselves and that they can learn from like my situation too. It's challenging, but I'm stubborn enough to keep going and keep talking to people about HIV and keep bringing it into light and bringing it into the public. I think one of the biggest challenges to a family when one of the kids is sick is on the parents. All my mom wanted to do was make me better, and she couldn't, and she can't. I have two brothers. We live with my mom. She's been a single parent pretty much all my life. Ellie was really bossy. <laughs> that, that hasn't gone away, though, really. Um, in some ways, she's so the same as she was when she was little. Um, and in some ways, she's a little different. Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, or EDS, is rare and rarely diagnosed. For two years, the doctors just didn't really know what to do. I underwent month-long hospitalizations, three probably unnecessary surgeries, a lot of stomach pain, not being able to walk suddenly. It was really difficult at first. My mom had to take a leave of absence for work because all of her time was uh, devoted to trying to figure out what was wrong with me. I lost a life that I had known for 13 years. It was all of a sudden, and I had no preparation, no roadmap for that. And you have to let yourself grieve for that. You have to let your family members and parents grieve for that because they also lost what they envisioned as your life. For a long time, I was waiting for something that was going to um, get her back to normal. I was torn between listening to Ellie and believing what she told me and listening to doctors who said that, it, that there wasn't really anything wrong with Ellie, that it was in her head. It was really hard to know what to do next. 
I remember this moment in the hospital when I was 13 and I had tried to walk to the bathroom and I'd fallen and I couldn't get up and the nurse was like, you just have to make her, just make her get up, get up, get up, get up. And then I was like, please just be my mom. I just decided that I was gonna listen to her and I was gonna advocate for her and I was always gonna support her in advocating for herself. I think things that have made it easier for me have been understanding that it's a new normal. This is Ellie's life, this is our life now, and I know that I have to trust her. I can't be in her body, I don't know what it's like. The only thing I have to do is believe her and trust her. There's never a moment that I doubt her love or her support for me. <laughs> Did you keep any? Man, this is real middle child syndrome here. I think it's difficult for any family to understand what one person is going through with diabetes. I was born and raised in Rhode Island. I am the second youngest of eight children. I get a lot of the, how are you and, and what's going on, but I really don't get the detailed questions about my diabetes. I'm currently packing to travel home to the East Coast to see my family. There's five things that I carry around daily that I need to have with me. Glucometer, insulin, insulin pumps, meters, test strips. Your blood sugar is your constant thought. Anytime you go to eat something, to drink something, to go for a walk, if you're gonna go to sleep, what is my number? How many units of insulin have I taken recently? Having type one diabetes be such a major part of my life and my family not understand it hurts. It feels like it doesn't matter. It feels like it's not as important. I love my family an incredible amount. I love them to death, but I wish that they knew more about me who I am, what I do every day. It's still pretty uncommon to have a service dog for type one, and I'm very blessed to have the opportunity to work with this dog. Diabetic alert dogs have only become more mainstream, I'd say over the last five years. Now that I work with a dog, when Forrest senses that my blood sugar is too high or too low, Forrest is trained to smell the chemical change in my body that I cannot feel and then alert me to that happening. He's there when I wake up. He's there when I go to sleep. He'll wake me up in the middle of the night if my blood sugar is low. He has no idea what he does for me. Forrest is my rock. I get to wake up and have a best friend who's going to fight diabetes with me every single day. <laughs> 